Hello and welcome to the second half of Physics 1A. In the second half of Physics 1A is divided into two topics. First off, thermal physics, and then we'll be looking at oscillations. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Angstman. If you need to find me, you can find me in room LG03 in the old main building. This is the first year physics office and it's right next to the first year lab. My email address is e.angstman at unsw.edu.au. Now, if there's anything in lectures that you don't understand, you can come and see me. If I'm in my office and free, then I'm happy to talk to you anytime. But I'll try and make sure that I'm free and in my office Monday 2 to 3 and Friday 2 to 3. Please see the teaching assistants if you have problems with the homework sets. But if there's anything from the lectures that you don't understand, then you can come and see me. So first of all, just some administration details. Just a reminder, as I'm sure you know, the lab marks are worth 20% of your final mark and 25% of this lab mark comes from your pre-work. So it's really worth doing the pre-work test before going to the lab because it helps you prepare for the lab plus it's a significant amount of your mark. There's also Moodle quizzes. There's six of these through the session. You've now got access to quiz three. Um, this is worth 20% of your final mark. Each quiz is worth 3.3%. So these are set by your lecturers. The final exam is worth 60% and you need to pass each component in order to pass the exam. So the exam timetable should be released in a few weeks time. The supplementary exam will be held on the 23rd of July. So if you think you may need the supplementary exam, please don't make travel plans on the 23rd of July. Make sure that you're in Sydney because this is the only date that the supplementary exam will be available. If you need help with any of the homework set problems or with the quiz after it's closed, then there's teaching assistance available. They're available in room 2, which is the room next to the first year lab, Monday 12 to 3, Wednesday 12 to 3, and Friday 12 to 3. You can download the lecture notes from Moodle, which if you're watching this video, you've probably already found. So my lecture notes can be found under the heading Thermal Physics and then Dr. Elizabeth Angstman's lecture notes. I'll upload PowerPoints, which I'll be using during the lectures and also after the lecture, after the last, there's two lectures, so after the second lecture, um, I'll be uploading a video. Sometimes these videos can take a while to process through UNSW TV, so I will be doing it, but you may need to be a little bit patient. If you need to catch up on the lecture straight away, then you may want to use the Echo 360 recordings, but these won't have the worked examples in them because they don't record the boards. Now, before we started the lecture in the class, we did a quick test to see what you know about thermal physics. Then what we'll be doing after the thermal physics te topic has been completed is another test to see how much you've actually learned. So hopefully you will learn a lot. Thermal physics is a bit more difficult than mechanics because it's less intuitive. We can't go back to fundamental principles as much. Where possible we will, but some of that is beyond the scope of this course. If you go on and do third year statistical mechanics, you'll be seeing where some of these equations come from. So for thermal physics, we need to use approximations. You'll be seeing one of these today. It also means that the often for thermal physics experiments are harder to conduct, so unfortunately there'll be a few less demonstrations than there are for mechanics. This video is going to cover sections 18.1 to 18.3 of the textbook. Okay, so to start with, the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law simply states that if object A and B are in separately in thermal equilibrium with object C, so that means no heat flows between A and C, or between B and C, then object A and B are in equilibrium with each other. So A and B, there's no heat flow between A and B, as there was no heat flow between A and C, or between B and C. The definition of temperature is really based on the concept of thermal equilibrium. 
two things in thermal equilibrium are said to be at the same temperature. And things are in thermal equilibrium if when they're touching there's no heat flow between them. It's not always intuitive. Imagine the stool on a really cold day. It's got a bottom half made of metal and a top half with a cushion on it. On the cold day, if you touch it, the metal's going to feel much colder than the cushion. But in fact, they are at the same temperature. It's just that the metal conducts heat a lot more efficiently and so it will conduct the heat away from your fingers and it will feel colder to touch. There's several physical properties that change with temperature. One of these is the volume of a liquid. If you heat a liquid such that it's not boiling but getting hotter, then the volume will increase. The dimensions of a solid also change when it's heated. The pressure of a gas at constant volume also changes, which is why it's important not to put a gas bottle near a fire because the pressure inside will increase and if it gets too high, the gas bottle can explode. The volume of a gas at constant pressure also changes. So an example of this is the atmosphere. During a hot day, the top of the atmosphere actually rises because the volume of the gas expands and then overnight when it cools down it contracts and we can also get a color change so for example in those mood rings that you can get or on the thermometers that you stick on the side of fish tanks you can see a color change indicating the temperature traditionally temperature is being measured with the thermometer how a thermometer works is it's filled with a liquid which expands as it's heated. So as it expands, it takes up more room in this capillary tube and so it moves along. Traditionally, these thermometers are cal calibrated at two temperatures. They're calibrated at zero degrees C, so it's put into a mixture of ice and water that should be at zero degrees C at atmospheric pressures. And when it's come to equilibrium, there's a mark made on the thermometer saying that that's zero degrees. The thermometer is then put into boiling water, which at atmospheric pressure is at 100 degrees C, and a mark for 100 degrees C is made on it. Between that zero and 100 degree mark is then split down into 100 little increments, and each of those is called a degree. That's how a traditional thermometer works. We now have much more accurate thermometers for using in experiments where a lot of accuracy is required. So there's three different temperature scales which are in common usage, degrees C, degrees Kelvin and degrees Fahrenheit. In this course we're not going to be using degrees Fahrenheit, this is traditionally used in the US and the Fahrenheit scale was set as 100 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to body temperature, which isn't an especially scientific way to do it, so that's why we're not going to use it. Zero degrees Celsius is defined as the temperature at which ice melts, and 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature at which water boils at atmospheric pressures. The spacing between a degree C and a degrees Kelvin is the same. So Kelvins are the most useful temperature scale. The temperature scale only has one direction. We do have an absolute minimum temperature. There's no absolute maximum temperature, though it is hard to get above certain temperatures because, I, I mean, the atoms and particles have so much energy that you really can't keep them together anymore. So there's an absolute zero of temperature, which is defined as zero Kelvin. Traditionally at this temperature we say all oh, motion ceases. I mean quantum mechanical effects come into play here and we get Bose-Einstein condensates and things formed which if you go on with physics you will learn more about. Zero degrees Kelvin is equal to minus 273.15 degrees C. So to convert between Kelvins and degrees C we have to either add or subtract the 273.15. So just to recap, you would be aware of this from high school or possibly even primary school. Solids made up of lots of little particles which are packed close together and can't really move. A liquid's made up of particles which are packed close together and can take on the shape of a container and can move over each other. 
Gas is made up of particles which can all move and will expand to fill whatever container they're put in. Slightly more advanced model is that a solid's made up of particles joined by little springs. The springs vibrate and at room temperature the amplitude of these vibrations is around 10 to the minus 11 meters and the spacing between them is 10 to the minus 10 meters. As we heat it up it vibrates even more and so the, the spacing between the particles actually increases. So this is important for lots of physical applications. So for example when we're building roads it's often important to put a gap in the road because on a hot day a black road surface will heat up a lot. This will cause the material to expand and if there's no gaps in the road then as it expands it's going to crack because there's nowhere for that expansion to go. So on a lot of roads you'll see metal plates like this or black shiny lines which are made up of material that can be compressed to stop the road cracking. This also happens in houses. Brick houses being built in climates where there's quite a large variation in temperature often have lines filled with a material that can contract or expand so that as the bricks that make up the house expand there's somewhere for this extra length to go in and so the bricks and the wall doesn't crack. We do have an equation to explain this. This equation is just an approximation so we, we can say that the change in length is equal to the expansion coefficient alpha Alpha is different for different materials and you would be told what it was um, times the initial length of the material times the change in temperature. So the change in temperature can either be in degrees C or kelvins, it doesn't matter because it's a change. The length, it doesn't matter what units you use as long as the change in length and the initial length have the same units. The units for the expansion coefficient are per degree C or per kelvin. If you want to practice using these equations, for higher physics try problems 1, 2 and 3 in set 4. For normal level physics try problems 1 and 2 in homework set 4. So this slide presents a few of the expansion coefficients. Aluminium is 24 times 10 to the minus 6. Concrete 12 times 10 to the minus 6 copper 17 times 10 to the minus 6 and steel 11 times 10 to the minus 6 just to give you a rough idea of the kind of expansion coefficients that we're talking about they're relatively small numbers here's a problem for us to try the concrete sections of a certain superhighway are designed to have a length of 25 meters the sections are poured and cured at 10 degrees C what minimum spacing should the engineer leave between the sections to eliminate buckling if the concrete is to reach a temperature of 50 degrees C? Okay, in this problem the initial temperature was 10 degrees C. We are told that on a hot day it can get up to 50 degrees C, so the final temperature is 50 degrees C. The length of the piece of highway we were talking about was 25.0 metres. And from the slide before that, we saw that alpha for concrete was equal to 12 times 10 to the minus 6 per Kelvin. Okay, so the equation we use, the change in length of this section of highway is given by alpha times the initial length of the highway times the change in temperature. This is an easy question, we just need to substitute in. 12 times 10 to the minus 6 times the 25.0 times the change in temperature which is 50 minus 10. Solving that on the calculator we get 0.012 meters which is equal to 1.2 centimeters. Now we should just have a think about whether this is a reasonable answer. This is the size of a gap in the roadway. If we drove over a 1.2 centimeter gap we wouldn't notice it. That would be fine, that is a reasonable answer. If we had something more like 30 centimetres, then the tyre could possibly get stuck in the gap and we'd have to question whether we'd done the question properly.